Hello, Telegraph Rugby Podcast listeners. I'm Danny Kerr and I've teamed up with Erwin Mitchell, the official legal partner of England Rugby, to share some special moments that matter from the game we care so much about. Search for Moments That Matter with Erwin Mitchell and The Telegraph. Hello, everybody. Delighted to have you back with us for The Telegraph Rugby Podcast. He's Charlie Morgan. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Ben. He's Charles Richardson. Hi, Charles. Hi, Ben. And I'm Ben Coles, all here to recap another enthralling weekend of Rugby World Cup action over in France. Charles, you were holding down the fort here at Telegraph Towers. How was that? Uh, I, I had serious joking aside. It was great. It was great being in London and great having a bit of a rest and great sort of um, helping out with the operation here. But as you were flying out on Friday, I did have serious FOMO. Real, real serious jealousy. When you're not in Friday France, out on Friday. when you're not in France, what is the one French thing that you miss the most? Um, good bread. Yeah, yeah. Good bread. Good cheap bread. Yes. I actually think that's a, that's a perfect answer. Charlie, where were you? I was in Nice. Cool. I had a lovely time. Yeah, what was, what <laughs> rub was it in, my, rub it in, my, go on Cass, rub it in. I, 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 loads of bread. Just wondered what you might have done or, or what no, games lots of you bread. were at. Portugal, or... by far the highlight was just watching Portugal. Use the word intrepid about a thousand times in, in a match report. They were a lot of fun. Um, England the next night against Japan was a bit more of an arm wrestle before it became good eventually. But Nice, absolutely lovely. Portugal, heartwarming. Oh, that's quite nice. Um, I, I was in... Nantes and Saint Etienne spent about fifty percent of my time in France over the weekend on TGV trains. Had had a, had a great time. You're um, impressed. You you oh you yeah. what's, what's up to us to but, say so? By the time on on Monday when I was doing three and a half hours from Lyon to Lille, I was fully brainwashed and, and I, I I loved it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I thought it was great. You're on right move. Yeah yeah I was. <laughs> but um, yeah, Ireland Tonga Saturday night fantastic, and then Australia Fiji on on Sunday. Um, as good as we hoped it would be. Um, some more highlights, please, gents. Charles, if I could start with, with you. Uh, what was a highlight from the weekend for you? Well, I think it's difficult to look beyond look beyond the Fijian win against Australia, but also just from, if we go back as far as last Thursday, just the, the, the huge strides taken by the Tier 2 teams across the board. Chile fell away in that second half against Samoa, but in the first half, you know, look, put some really good things together. Uruguay, pushed the hosts the whole way and, and France needs to improve hugely on that showing um, and obviously the Fijian heroes on on Sunday Charlie what about you yeah so on my, on my first night in Nice actually I was in a in a bar just back from the promenade and the France Uruguay game was on and the French obviously the what's been really interesting actually when we touched about it on the fir- touch on it in the first week was just this is a country that have really embraced the World Cup and there's th- this real feel good factor around the national team that was um, punctured somewhat by just how tenacious and how good Uruguay were, how well they moved the ball, and this bar was sort of close on edgy, close on close on anxious after sort of arousing, being really rousing during the anthems and stuff. So that was so that was great, and then for Portugal to kind of um, bolster that with another really really cool performance was great a couple of days later well they are volatile the French aren't they they will get behind them but then if it starts all going a bit pear-shaped they they won't hold back which is why as as you the point you made about the first game against New Zealand why that why that win was so important Mm. Portugal probably snuck into my highlights with that line-out move try I also thoroughly enjoyed uh, the bicycle box kick from Nagari in the Japan against England game that was great oh yeah thoroughly enjoyed that don't see enough of those and and yeah I, I was I was taken in by the the skill of it, an off-field one, um, probably would be trying to get to the stadium in Saint Etienne on Sunday, where my taxi driver realised the traffic ahead of us, and decided that just driving on the tram sort of track would be the quickest way for about five minutes. And we went past plenty of police cars, and they just sort of nodded as as he whizzed by. So yeah, that was a, that was big, a great way to get to the ground. Big tip. Uh, oh, of course, generous. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I respected his efforts. Anyway, Charlie, you were in Nice for England. They've won again. Let's dig into it. How, how good are this team? Let's have a chat about it. So England got a bonus point win over Japan to back up their win over Argentina. On, on paper, uh, that looks that looks quite nice, doesn't it? If we kind of dig into what you made of it, Charlie, there at the ground, it seems to be a, a kind of a public opinion from watching on TV that that they were not great 
for parts, but then sort of came through in the end. What was your take on it? My, my take having t- my take having taken in a bit of the bit of the public reaction, including immediately with the booing of Alex Mitchell on on forty five minutes, is what were people expecting? Were people expecting the whole USP behind these intricate attacks like Ireland's is that they take time and they take pain to get through and get right. England haven't had the time. They have had this this Six Nations, which was which was probably bitty and probably rushed, and now they've had this preseason to work up. They were always, always, always going to fall back on these pillars that we know Steve Borthwick really values, which are fitness, which is breakdown spoiling and defence, which is really a really kind of diligent line out operation and kicking. That was always going to happen. And yes, there is a frustration which is which is valid with the, with the um, basic errors. So. If you think about the way they, Freddie Stewart knocks on two metres from the line in in the third minute. They go wide a bit later on and Elliot Daly knocks on into touch. On the verge of half time, there's a really basic sort of malfunction, a line out peel and actually they've just mauled Japan a couple of times and maybe just maybe just that's the right right option. However, I think that the approach is just adjust these building blocks that are, that are totally fine. And they always, afterwards, they said, look, the plan was always going to be that we thought it would be quite tight and tense um, up, until the, up until the final quarter. And they ordered their selection pretty nicely in that regard. You know, bringing off, bring, the, bring Billy Vinipola off the bench, bringing Ellis Genge off the bench. Ben Youngs was superb, I thought, off the bench. And they've given Marcus Smith this remit to Rome as a, as a fullback and give the attack more depth and therefore more width. And actually, even before that, I thought they were they they gave it a bit more width over over the second half. Yes, they yes they do not want to play in their own half because they don't want to concede breakdown penalties in possession. Um, yes, they are backing their defence to force errors themselves. But you know what? That's that's all right for now. I think. Quite pleased to see Ben Youngs get a bit of recognition mm. for a good performance because that hasn't happened for a while. Ch- mm. Charles, you were you were back here watching it mm. um, through the old television. Mm. What? What sort of stood out to you taking it in? Uh, well, the, there was a lot of negativity that, that you've touched on, and it did seem certainly if you um, read the comment section of, of our readers and and look on Twitter and social media, it, it all did seem very doom and gloom. But I, you know, I do wonder whether we should take a bit of a step back, and England fans should sort of appreciate that two games in nine points, and I think before the tournament, any England fan would have bitten your hand off. For, for two games in nine points against Argentina against Japan, and and it comes back to the age old. It boils down to the age old thing of, of 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 what is entertaining on a rugby field because those three drop goals from George Ford against Argentina in ten minutes, three kicks that scored nine points, were as entertaining up, up there as an as the most entertaining moment of the entire weekend in the Rugby World Cup, um, and yet they were three kicks. We, we bizarrely didn't see a drop goal against Japan, not one, not not one attempt. Um, so you know, is is kicking by default lacking in entertainment? I'm I'm not really too sure. And England still scored four tries anyway. Japan would I thought I thought I know Japan. It, it seems like this England team, England this England team's quite easy to mock at the minute, and that it's easy oh, to caveat. Yeah. And and that header from Joe Marler was <laughs> hilarious, and I actually burst out laughing and turned. I had Neil Squires yeah. to my left and said, "It is quite funny that we're 54 minutes in and the two tries we're calling for tries, and the two tries have come from a botched Japan Japan lineout." And a, and a header where everybody stops. However, we can, and, and their victories are being caveated. You know, Argentina were terrible. Japan were ranked 14 in the world and they were nowhere near as, as good as they were in 2015 and 2019. Um, but, you know, before the, before the tournament, the, the, the messaging was that England were crashing out straight away. Mm. So there's, pro, there's progress there. And the fitness is another really, really um, impressive aspect that they told us they were going to get right and it looks like they are they are seriously fit ben ben earl has grown into two games superbly and by the end um he was if you if you look look at it back his his actions sort of in multiple fa- in in sets of phases and one at one point in the just before half time he carries in midfield he gets up there's another there's another phase and on the third phase he's carrying again both of them puncturing japan and they um, and that eventually leads to a really important penalty. I thought Japan, having we've known they've struggled over this cycle, but I thought they came with a couple of um, wrinkles that frustrated England a bit. That short kicking game, I know they're exiting sometimes was a little bit, little bit shambolic, but 
that made England think. Set piece was far better than it was in November. That was another that, thing. That, that Jamie line outside. But. That was another thing. Jamie Joseph Harley said. I think our scrummaging probably surprised England a yeah, bit. Yeah, was. And I thought they defended all right as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I find this sort of um, comparisons with England to two thousand and three a, a little bit unfair and a little bit sort of banal now. But what it is worth remember, remembering is that is that England struggled against Samoa in in the pool in two thousand and three. You know, that Samoa had them at half time, and, and and nobody at that point. With with an England team that w- were excellent, but they weren't um, entertainers. That they weren't they weren't a circus act. That two thousand and three England team, they got by them, and, and no one was no one was heavily criticising England two thousand and three England at half time for being a bit sort of turgid and conservative. And as Steve Borthwick alluded to afterwards, finding a way to win, working it out on the field, and doing what they needed to do to win the game. I think Steve Borthwick's suggestion afterwards was: Yes, we've beat Japan. Uh, we've scored four tries. It wasn't pretty at times, but I think his his sort of suggestion was that we're building a team here whereby if it hadn't have been Japan today, if it had been South Africa, I want the players to be in a position whereby they can find a way to win. What did he say every week when he was in charge of Leicester Tigers? It was all about the next game to the point where you're like, nah, he's got to be thinking a little bit ahead and he's got to be looking at sort of two weeks down the line and how this is, you know, we've got to, they've got to get some momentum here. But no, they lived that cliche, that Leicester Tigers team, and that's what brought them so much success. They really did. I think it was George Ford afterwards in his post-match interview admitted that it, it wasn't the the prettiest. I'm, I'm finding this sort of disconnect between supporters and the team really interesting, mainly because Borthwick and England seem to keep coming out afterwards and saying, oh, that's a great memory for the supporters, that sort of win that we've had over Argentina. That came up in the, in the I was going to, what's it called, the behind-the-scenes England documentary? Yeah. There was, there was both which sent to the players, you've created a memory for all the supporters here and all the supporters back home. And the supporters back home seem to have been like, oh, yeah, that was quite pleasantly surprising. And then again this week, it's, oh, the supporters really enjoy this win. And the supporters are like, well, you were kind of scrappy and you literally scored fire a Falcon header assist. There just seems to be a bit of a gap there. And I wonder whether, I don't know if games now against Chile and Samoa where England are expected to win... I don't know if that cap's going to be bridged by the time you get to a crunch quarterfinal where all of a sudden the pressure's really on. It's just quite an interesting dynamic how England are trying to encourage. It feels like they're trying mm. to forcefully encourage a bit more, get behind us, and I yet that's not quite there. I think I think regardless of sort of our opinion of it, of it and as sort of depending, uh, defending what Steve Borthwick is doing slightly, I think there are tangible positives, I think, from England on Saturday. There were genuine things where, where irrefutably... Things went well. Ben Earl was excellent. As you mentioned, Charlie, the fitness was excellent. The set piece was excellent. Uh, the kicking at times was excellent. Uh, and certainly the chasing of it was excellent. And they are sort of foundation pillars whereby you can build, as you, as you suggested. And I think there is, there is enough to hang your hat on here that England should be getting with, with the form of Australia, with the form of Wales, and with Fiji playing as they are, I think a, a semi-final is, is realistic um, beyond that is anybody's guess and I'm not so confident but I think they should be disappointed if they don't get to a semi I think I, I agree and I think I, I can, I'm almost laughing now thinking about it here because a, a lot of what I've heard is first time England play a good team they're going to get pumped if you put that to Steve Borthwick he would again we, we, we've mentioned about how sort of single minded he can be but he'd say we're playing who we're playing you can play. You're playing who you're playing. You he another thing about him at Leicester was that he when it got to big games, he had bespoke strategies for said big games. It's an interesting point you make about what do they get now out of the rest of the group stage. I think they would want to be really convincing and they want to be more clinical against Chile for sure, and that might include a little bit more ball movement from um, higher up in higher up in the field. Um, but then they might think that that's less of a risk because. They've probably got what it takes to keep the ball a bit better against against Chile, and it's an earlier kickoff, so the ball's ne- not necessarily going to be as as wet. Um, and then the next game is is Samoa, where you're almost in any win or do territory, aren't well, you? Given how good, given Samoa, I wanted be to ask you, Charles, what about Samoa because I think you had an eye on how they yeah. went. What did you see? Well, they they took a while to get going, um, and yet in sort of France fashion, they were still leading at the break, which was which was a credit to them. Because uh, sort of Chile came flying out the blocks. Samoa hadn't played. That was their first game, you know, 13 days into the tournament, which is is a bit, which is a, a sort of a bit odd in itself. Um, 
and then in the second half they, they they ran free really and they and they they scored they scored more tries as well which you wouldn't necessarily expect from a from a Samoan team um so they looked strong they looked strong um that game against Argentina on Friday night is on a weekend of very big games you know up there really really up there. and I mean if Samoa win that would be actually an ideal result for England because it would take a, quite a bit of the pressure off that last game an Argentina win means that England would have to beat Samoa and Samoa would be playing to stay in the competition in that final pool game. Um, but a Samoa win on Friday night and then Argentina, they're gone. Just to go back to something you mentioned, Charlie, about um, England aren't going to be playing at 9pm at night and they're not going to be playing on the south coast of France, which should hopefully mean the ball is a little less tricky to handle. I, I raise this because we managed to get a headline on the website with the word sweaty balls in it. So I think that has to be... That has to be referenced. Um, that might lead to a change of approach, potentially, because they are the team, uh, based on the stats over the last two uh, two opening rounds, who've kicked the most during the tournament, which isn't a shock given they, they want to kick. But also, Ford was saying afterwards, wasn't he, in his mix and interview, that they, they sort of have done that after out of necessity because the ball has been a bit like a bar of soap. So could that potentially lead to maybe a bit more of a I don't know, bit more of an expansive attack against Chile and Samoa? I think so. What's going to be really interesting is how they balance their back line because I think a lot of their, their back line isn't necessarily set up to move the ball and if it is, there's a lot of onus on Elliot Daly as that second playmaker when you've got uh, a, part, a centre partnership of two, Laggy and March, and, and a fullback who's Freddie Stewart, who actually who actually linked a little bit better, I thought, on Saturday, but it, mm. Sunday, sorry, Sunday night, but isn't that's not his his natural game. Um, Ford talking about that actually gave me a bit of deja vu because in 2019, in the humidity of in in, of, in Japan, ironically, that was something that South Africa and England did really well. That was clearly in their heads throughout the tournament and it worked really well for both of them and they both got to the final. And I've, I've written a, a piece on sort of a report card for England after those two games and I think one... Um, positive thing to come out of the experience that Steve Borthwick has, has picked as being those guys from 2019 to go look in 2019 they started off against Tonga and I looked it up because this is seriously sad but I looked up the world ranking of, of Tonga at the time they were 13th so obviously Japan are 14th now and England beat them with a bonus point in the 77th minute just to tag on a, a quick thought about that you talked about them, them being ready for humidity in 2019 but not now they, they switched training camps didn't they from Treviso up to Verona and Borthwick said we wanted heat, not humidity to sort of practicing because that's what we're expecting in France. It's just interesting how that change of training bases maybe changed their, their methods. And, um, and you'd have to say on the evidence of Sunday night that it hasn't quite worked so far because, I mean, the, it was the individual errors that were so costly. I mean, it was just they'd, they'd put two or three nice phases together. They'd work their way up the field, get to the 22, sloppy knock-on. There was a Will Stewart one on the line as well where he's picked up with – might have scored – and and it's just knocked on, and it was just it was just killing them. So I know I don't know. Maybe they should be training more with fairy liquid on the ball or something like that. Or the tape on the end. You remember the plasters mm. on the end of the fingers? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's another cheat. <laughs> Are you accusing? No, no, another of... cheat. Cheat code. Oh, so fine. I sorry, yeah. I was going to say that would be that would be bad. Um, no Charles... speculation. <laughs> Cut that out. Charles, Charles, in terms of potential. Um, changes. Brian Moore's written a column on, on the website about they need to get Marcus Smith just involved more. Could you see it almost seems a bit mad to, to get rid of George Ford at mm. 10 um, or I guess Freddie Stewart has such a long run of tests at fullback like the, the, you could see why they would keep selecting them but Smith does seem to bring something when he comes on and that, and you know maybe that is the creativity that they could be looking for. I mean this weekend against Chile is fascinating because you'd bet a large sum that Owen Farrell will come straight back in and, and captain the side. They obviously saw the long-term vision as Ford Farrell at 10 and 12, uh, well certainly as an option, as a very viable option, um, but that they haven't had a run out. So do they keep Ford Farrell at 10, 12 and Smith at 15 and then have two sort of out-and-out -out wingers, bring Arundel in? Um, I mean, Malins hasn't played really, so he could do with a run out as well, but then he's not really an out-and-out -out winger, he's a bit of a bit of a ball player um, it's a tricky one it's a tricky one I would go I think I would go Ford um, Ford Farrell Smith um, Twalangi and Lawrence I think Lawrence needs to play look good off the bench and I think if you're going to go Ford Farrell going forward you might need Lawrence at 13 although that's harsh on Marchant Marchant could maybe move to the wing he's looked really good as well um, I just don't know how I don't know how Ford Farrell 
Manu Twalangi get all in the same team. I'm just sort of, I, I don't think they do necessarily. Ford Farrell Smith's like death by a thousand playmakers, isn't it? You're just gonna, you're just gonna try. <laughs> it is, but then I think if you mitigate with with out and out threats, I think mm. you're just about all right. Um, I mean, I wouldn't go Ford Farrell Smith um, against Samoa or in a quarterfinal. I think I'd go. I'd, put Stewart at the back just for a bit of insurance, a bit of safety. Mm. I know he's um, limited in other areas, but Borthwick's always been about super strengths. With Leicester, he always talks about super strengths, and, and, and you need your super strong players on the field, if that makes sense. Just two things to kind of throw into the melting pot. I, I haven't got a back line to give you because it's just melting my head, the amount of options that they've got. But two things. One one thing that I think Charles is getting at when you say that the uh, Ford, Ford Farrell 2, Laggy, you're not sure about is that lateral pace. Joe yes. Marchant has shown that really well. Yep. He's, he's scrambled really well, drifted really well, looked like a really key cog of that defence. Second thing is how ironic that the the amount of times that we've seen um, Ben Youngs get absolutely pilloried and then the nine that comes on and has quick ball, go, why isn't that guy starting? Mm. Then you flip it around, that's exactly what happened on Sunday. And then you, you just, you've sometimes just got to give coaches for the way they're ordering their, squ- their squads. And actually, I think... Marcus Smith at 15 has been a big part of that. Steve Borthwick trialled it against Ireland, trialled it against Fiji. And the timing of it, could he maybe have come on a little bit earlier? Maybe. But this is a ploy. This is quite a bold ploy, an unconventional ploy um, that I think deserves... You've got to give credit to the coaching team. I think Kevin Sinfield is the one that um, that suggested it. And I think it might have just only come on about come come out of the fact that Owen Farrell is, is um, banned at the moment uh, previously. However, I think it's 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 a it's a good point that worked really well. Gave England depth mm. um, with that second with that second distributor worked really nicely. And it, and Smith, when you think about his distribution, allied to that ability to beat players one on one if they're shooting out to beat him. I think that's I think it's really dangerous. There is also a wider point here that it's easier for us nine replacements, scrum half replacements, to come off the bench and impress. I think when the game's broken up, because yeah. you can come on and you can actively increase tempo when really the hard work of sort of breaking down the defence has already been done by, by, by the starting nine. You, you, look, you look at Jack Van Portfleet when he came off the bench in that Australia tour, he was the, he was the next big thing, best thing since sliced bread. Then he starts, then, yeah, quite. And then he starts at nine, and then he starts at nine and everyone's sort of hammering him a bit for, for, for kicking too much ball away and for, uh, and for slowing down the tempo. But sometimes that's sort of what, needed, sort of what is needed then the replacement comes on just to just to free things up a bit, and, and that's that's not just a, an English thing. That is a thing across the board. You look at Cam Roygaard when he comes on for New Zealand, often comes on and makes a great impact. That doesn't mean to say that Aaron Smith has not played well, um, but it just means that the, the sort of tempo and the sort of entire fabric of the game is in, entirely different. Only two selection notes for me. Lo- love that Dan Cole basically got to have a, a Sunday off and kind of rest after the Argentina game, and he can he can be sort of drip fed back into maybe he'll get a few minutes against one of. Chile or Samoa, maybe Samoa mm. a start against Samoa, and then maybe. he's and then he's ready. Sinclair looked good though. Yes, that was nice. Mm. Yeah, that was good after reason. And, and they're sort of on a similar theme with Sinclair. Give Henry Arundel eighty minutes against Chile and just let him. I feel like he's had such a muddled start to his kind of England career. He hasn't necessarily played well when when given the chances so far. This is kind of a nice window just to let him let him run. The unknown about him is his back. I'd say we, do, mm. we don't know how how serious and how much those. Um, Back spasms are affecting him, but no, I agree. That's England. Two wins from two. They're laughing. We all said it would be fine after Fiji, didn't we? Um, speaking of Fiji, involved in the game of the weekend for the second week in a row. Fantastic victory. First victory over Australia since 1954. It leaves Group C on a knife edge. Let's talk about that. We're going to hear from the former Wallabies captain, James Horwell, who was speaking to Charlie. Hi, Danny Kerr here. I've teamed up with Erwin Mitchell, the official legal partner of England Rugby and The Telegraph, to talk to you about the moments that matter. During a special time for rugby, we're speaking to current and former England players to find out about those moments that mean everything to them. If you want to protect the things that mean everything to you, now and in the future, then Erwin Mitchell's legal and financial experts can help you plan for the moments that matter. To find out more, search for Moments That Matter with Erwin Mitchell and The Telegraph. Hi, James. Welcome to The Telegraph Rugby Podcast. Thanks so much for your time. Let's get straight into this. Fiji Fiji 22, Australia 15. First Australia lost to Fiji since 1954 and at serious risk of missing out on the knockouts at a World Cup for the first time. Tell me about the mood over there first. 
Oh, look, there's a bit of shock and a bit of disappointment. I think, obviously, um, you know, going into the to the game, there was, you know, maybe a bit of nerves, particularly with what had happened during the week with losing probably two of our most damaging forwards in Taniella and Big Will Skelton um, early, in the, early in the piece. So, look, I think overall, um, I mean, shock's probably not the right word, but, you know, there's a bit of disappointment. And, you know, I think while there's still life, in the fact that we can still, you know, make the, the pool stages, particularly coming up against Wales, um, is something that we're sort of holding on to. And uh, I think there's a lot of, until that happens, uh, and we definitely can't make it, I think there'll be a, a little bit, um, you know, we're, we're still holding out hope, I guess, from a, from the Australian point of view. But yeah, obviously, bitterly disappointing to the team. But, you know, I think we have to give credit to Fiji. They were, um, they were the better team on the day game plan and we're able to execute better than um, better than the Australian team, that's for sure. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie was quick to, like you've done, give give credit to Fiji. Um, is it a viable gets out for, for him that a lot of this Australia side will be around hopefully for the Lions in 2025 and the next World Cup in 2027 or do we have to look into how Eddie have, has, has prepared the side for this tournament? Well, look, I think you know, there's a lot of questions that can be asked around, you know, time that he's had, um, you know, only having five games before a, before a big tournament, obviously wanting to pick. Uh, he's actively and gone out and said, we need a younger team. We need to get them exposed. Now, whether whether doing that at a World Cup is the right choice or whether going, look, let's do what we can to win this World Cup and let's start again post, you know, from November 1st onwards is basically where we're, you know, we're, we're attacking it, but maybe his, you know, his viewpoint, I'm not sure what it is, but maybe that's, you know, his exposure is like, we just need to expose these guys to this because if we're going to win the next one, we need as many people with World Cup experience under their belt. And I guess if we didn't do that and moved on a few guys, we'd have, you know, there'd be a lot of guys going to a home World Cup in four years' time with zero World Cup experience. And, you know, we're already seeing it's a different, it's a different beast playing at a World Cup, the intensity, and then adding the fact that it would be a home World Cup, you know, the pressures that come with that, maybe that's the decision-making that's sort of driven Eddie and the, and the management to, to go down the path he has. But look, it's, you know, you, you want to go to a World Cup, you want to win it. I, I mean, there's no doubts in my mind that that's the, you know, that's the main game. I think we're seeing, you know, a bit more different style of rugby. Um, you know, we're seeing Fiji, you know, you know, outscored two tries to one and win a game. I mean, I don't think we would have ever spoken about that previously, you know, that they're taking shots for poles and things like that. So that that shows you that World Cups are different. You know, I guarantee if you play Fiji in a, in a friendly in an autumn international over in the UK, they won't be taking as many shots for poles. They'll be tapping and going and running the ball like they normally do. So I think you've got to understand that World Cups are different. Um, and I think that's something that maybe has driven, you know, Eddie's selection of a younger team uh, and exposing these guys to something that they probably hadn't or need to experience and, you know, learning the hard way. Is he, we, from what we've heard, him, him coming in um, to, the, to the Wallabies' chop, top job was always a case of maybe working backwards from 2027. Is his job in peril if... If the worst happens against Wales, oh, I don't know. I think look, there's that's probably for the guys that are that are above my pay grade. But look, I think there's been certainly you, you have to look at that. That hasn't been said obviously by the the you know the by Rugby Australia, but by signing into a lot, such a long term deal, you'd have to think that we have un, you know you've got to understand what's coming down the pipe for for rug, for Rugby Australia, obviously. We've got a you know a home lion series, which we know how important, how massive that is, not only for you know rugby, but but also the, the game in the financial state that we're in currently. And then also you've got a, a home World Cup two years later for the men, and then you've got a home World Cup two years later for the women in 2029. And then we have a, an Olympic Games in Brisbane in 2032, where we'll have hopefully the, the chance to win. So there's a real lengthy process of big. Australian rugby events in this country that we need to make the most of and um, I think we'd, anyone would be lying to say that that wasn't in the back of a lot of people who are planning you know higher up in rugby Australia's mind that you know we need to make sure we get them right particularly at home in, in our crowded mar sporting marketplace. 
we're, we're a long way away. But speaking of crowded sporting marketplaces, it seemed as though Eddie's kind of force of personality had a bit of impact as far as pushing Union to the top of that or certainly making a few waves within it. Um, is that still the case now? Uh, yeah, well, well, I think that for the, you know, probably for the right reasons, in, you know, when, when he first came on, um, you know, it was a big, he, he's a, he's a big character, Eddie. And he, I, look, he, he knows, as you would have experienced over there, he knows, you know, nothing I, you know, anything that seems off the cuff and random, I don't believe is, um, you know, there's a plan for what he's doing and he's got an idea and it's a, it's a strategic ploy for, for one reason or the other. It might not be the same strategic ploy that we believe, but there's a reason to it. And certainly his injection and then the signing of particularly targeting a number of high profile rugby league players, um, drew a lot of attention from the rugby league media, which is a big part of Sydney and Brisbane, uh, the cities where, you know, rugby is probably its strongest. Um, now there's probably the media is probably turned a little bit based on the results you know with he's won you know uh two uh, one game in seven um uh and not had the performance you know and the team's ranked i don't know where we are after the weekend but we were sort of a ninth eighth ninth position which is not where the australian public are used to seeing the wallabies right where you know we think of the golden generation the early 2000s you know winning bledders lows winning world cups you know losing in a world cup final but you know, I think a big part of Australian culture, it's very similar with England, the, 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 the country expect their national team to win, whether it's cricket, whether it's rugby, whether it's rugby league, whether it's football, but yeah, particularly rugby and, and rugby and cricket, you know, the expectation is that our national team will go out and they'll win. Um, and so when that doesn't happen and there's performances and the fact that, you know, we, we could bomb out of a World Cup for the first time in, um, you know, ever in the pool stages... Um, there's certainly some some areas of the media and, and you know the rugby league media are probably taking that opportunity to to stick the boot in, uh, as you may know here that obviously the codes are, you know, while we also we get along, we always we're all fighting for the same talent, for the same sponsorship dollars, for the same fans, uh, it, which makes it quite a unique sporting marketplace. You've played in World Cup knockout games yourself in, in 2011, 2015. That's essentially where the Wallabies are now. Um, what would it be like in camp heading towards the Wales game? Yeah, look, I think there'd be a bit, you know, there'll be high tension. I think obviously there's some selection issues. We've had some injuries. So I think, well, my opinion is the fact that, you know, there's been made decisions of internally that, you know, Will and Taniella won't be available for this weekend. I think it's a good thing. It gives guys a bit of clarity and security around what they're doing. Um, selection will be interesting to see what, uh, Eddie does um, and you know you'd be wanting to give the guys that are starting as much time together as possible during the week so that's something that would be interesting to come you know I'd expect Wales to play a much different game to Fiji a lot more territory based a lot more you know they'll be very hard at the breakdown they would have seen how poor we were at our attacking clear and how many how, how much success the Fijians were able to have so I think we'll see something similar from the Welsh, but with a more tactical kicking now. It's a high pressure game that we've seen from Warren Gatlin's teams over the year. Kick to the kick, you know, don't put it out and make them make Australia run out and pressure and, and try and turn that pressure into points. So, look, I think this week in camp, you know, they will know the players, you know, will, will, Eddie will try and not speak about it, I imagine, but it would be very much front and back of mind that. You know, we you know it's, it's win or go home pretty much this weekend. And even if we do win, we're still waiting on results and bonus points and all that. But the main thing for the guys this weekend is it's 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 win at all costs. Will they do it? I think we will. I think we will probably have a game plan that will probably suited to how Wales play. I mean, you know, the, I don't think the Welsh have played particularly well. Um, you know, they played. They, they were able to squeeze Fiji in that first half um, and then, you know, probably did enough to get the job done against Portugal, but that was it. You know, get a bonus point. I don't think they were overly impressive against, you know, a pretty valiant Portuguese side. So I think the ability is to, to not lose our nerve. As I said, I think we'll see a lot of kicking, a lot of pressure in terms of, you know, high contestables, digging into the corner, trying to make the Wallabies play out of their own zone. 
So, you know, you've got to be disciplined and to your kick strategy, which I think will be vital again this weekend. And when Australia had the opportunity, we saw, I think, against Fiji, when we did, you know, pick the tempo up and we're able to win those collisions, we did look a lot better, but we were just not consistent enough and got turned over at the wrong time, particularly in that, late in that second half where we had a few opportunities. You know, I think we would have bought, blown like three to four key attacking opportunities in the Fiji in 22, which could have, you know, turned into a different result. Um, you you played under Eddie a long time ago at the Reds. I'm not, I'm not asking you about that, but the these games where you've got Eddie Jones versus Warren Gatlin this weekend, these games when there are these big personalities in charge of sides, what's it like as a player? Are you just happy for them to do the press and get on with, get on with your own prep? Yeah, well, I think probably for the young guys, I think that's probably the way they look at it. If you look at the guys, they probably don't want to be in front of the camera. You know, there'd be, again, a lot of tough questions regarding, you know, they don't need to be reminded what's at stake. Um, and I think Eddie and and probably Warren, both of them will, will enjoy, you know, throwing the barbs out. You know, I remember Czech, when, when I was part of the Wallaby side, when Eddie toured, uh, down under, and it was basically Czech versus Eddie for, for for three weeks. I don't think anyone else got a word in. It was just the two of them going at it. And, you know, I guess as you're a bit older, and I was sort of right at the back end of my test career, and I sort of you could sit back and, and laugh and appreciate it, you know, for what it is, for the theatre, which, you know, which is what drove seats, drove attention, drove media space. But I think, um, yeah, for the guys now in, in the in the in the camp, I think they'll be happy to steer clear of any sort of media duties and you know the more Eddie can take the better that was James Hall great to hear from him um, fantastic game in Sonetien on Sunday where Fiji were actually outscored in terms of tries and won, <laughs> and, won and, and won so well I mean I, did you get a chance to see much of it the both of you because uh, there was you, a full yeah. there was a full press room of UK journalists watching it in Nice and I couldn't possibly tell you who they were all supporting I have a an idea who they might have been supporting. Charles, did you get to have uh, a Yeah, I watched the whole thing. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. I mean, how good were how good were Bottier and Tuasova? Oh. They were so good. If I try and um, I'll try and unpack it as well as I can having having been there. Um gotta say, walking in, saw so many gold shirts. I, I did wonder if it was gonna be basically an all Australian crowd, because they because they turned out Really, really well. And actually, once you got into the stadium, there was a good mix of Fijian fans and obviously all the French fans wanted Fiji to, to win as well, just like they did in Bordeaux because of the top 14 connections with a lot of the squad and, and also just because, you know, it's a, it's a nice it's a nice story. I was I was so impressed with so many elements of, of Fiji's game. I, I want to start talking about Kuruvali's goal kicking. This I find fascinating. So he was the sub scrum half who scored at Twickenham the other week. Came with the bench and did fairly well against Wales. Got the start this week. And we asked um, Simon Rao Louis about his goal kicking afterwards. And yeah, he's been like goal kicking in the in the background and since Fiji under 20s or whatever. But I looked up his record on, on All Rugby, which is currently the, the go-to website, I guess, for stats. And he's only, for the Drua, he's only ever kicked two penalties in a conversion. <laughs> and then he starts against Australia in the World Cup in front of a sellout crowd bangs over five kicks and goes off not because he's injured because he's got cramp they were like yeah we just had to take him off because he cramped up I was staggered what was his quote oh yeah he was asked if he'd ever kicked um, five out of five before in a game and he just went to be honest nah <laughs> which I just I thought was was absolutely wonderful I mean not in any game ever <laughs> it's just great isn't I, it I, and also well like, it sounds like he's not even had five attempts at goal in a game before well, let alone well, got them all yeah and there's five and there's having five Getting five out of five kicks and, and well done. They were from right in front of the post. These were hard. Like, these were penalties from forty-five meters, like on the angle. In a game they built up, the, yeah, the yeah. sort of emotional pressure. The on do it. or die game, as they called it after Wales. He, he banged over the touchline conversion after to a sofa score. Yeah, I was just, I was staggered. And how how glad might Australia be that he wasn't there at the end to kick that to kick that penalty at the end to yeah. deprive them of a losing bonus point? Yeah, they were convinced that that was going to hit the post and just set up a because that last 
the last sort of quarter was just so fraught, wasn't it? There was yeah. a, there was a real big sort of kicking exchange. Yeah, there was a kick <laughs> where <laughs> and every every Fijian line out was going to yeah. pot, wasn't oh, it? It was just yeah. really it was, it was fantastic. It was, it was like Nadal Djokovic kick tennis. Yeah, yeah. It, it was just great. it was just exquisite. It was brilliant. That they were just yeah. they were just waiting for an error, weren't they? It was a fantastic game of chess. Um, the, Fiji just do things re- the things they do well. Obviously, they carry fantastically. And that carrying, even if it hasn't, even if it didn't yield tries, is, is still there because they're just so hard to stop. And Tuasova against Karevi at twelve was just as good as advertised. I think it was Tuasova in the opening minute sent Karevi flying back onto his backside, and I just thought this is this is fantastic. But it's the difference between Fiji now and the Fiji who've entertained this at World Cups in the past is they can just control a game really well. And I think when Caleb Munts got injured after. After the win over England at Twickenham, and he and he did his knee in training. I think we all thought, ah, oh, well, that's the bloke who can control Fiji and get them in the right areas. Gone, and how are they going to manage that? And actually, against Australia, they replaced it with really good box kicking from Kurivoli and then Lamani when he came on. The scrum was good. The lineout started well and and kind of t- descended, <laughs> tailed off <laughs> fairly drastically. But it was it was the kicking game from the fullback and scrum half and and the, and the wings. I was just, I was just so impressed with how it did, put it this way. Some people were calling it an upset, but it didn't feel like an upset. Like they were comprehensively the better team from start to finish. This is not to denigrate the, his performance at all, but I bet Bottier wouldn't mind Andrew Brace refereeing every single mm. one of his games well, ever, yeah. ever, ever. He was, he was the guy in charge of um, when Saracens got uh, Bottiered against La Rochelle, yeah. and I. Brace just doesn't mind that competition. He gives a lot of rights to the Jacklers, I think. And Bottier just <laughs> doesn't need a second invitation, doesn't he? He's brilliant. He's just phenomenal over the ball. And I mean, so did, did Australia win one holding on penalty? I can't remember. I can't remember. Off the top of my jacket. head, I can't remember one. No, which is which is. Has you know, fifteen been great. cited as well for the? Not no, as of no, yet. That, that was quite bad. Yeah, but he played so well. Can we not? <laughs> it, well, that was in the, that was in the in the sort of the finale, which was just mad, yeah, wasn't it? it was like, that, would, that looked quite bad, actually. I don't know. We're on. We're on. Something else is happening. They, it's a Fiji they, line out. They also yeah. got an early three points from what might be the softest penalty of all time. That Nick White swinging arm in inverted well, colours that, that I'd made say absolutely that, no contact with anything whatsoever. I'd say that all balances out though with the, with the Aussie try and the Richie Arnold turnover on the deck. Quite quite I thought you were. Also, I thought you were going to say what happened to them in Bordeaux as well. Well, these, well, these yeah, and, and, and Bordeaux, and then also the actual quick lineup for the try looked a bit suspect. With mm. did the ball actually travel five meters? I, I, I don't know. So that, so, yeah. In terms of Australia, because we should talk about Australia, um, Eddie Jones afterwards fairly um, despondent, not not snappy, not angry, very kind of aware that, or, or eager to stress rather that this is a young team. <laughs> you can counter argue that's a young team. Because he's chosen a young team. <laughs> because he's he's left Michael Hooper Com- at home to complaining do complaining about the team that he's selected. Yeah, he, he's left Michael Hooper at home to do TV punditry and Craig Cooper and Bernard Foley, who are nearly combined age of seventy between them, are, are not there to run the show at fly half, despite having been involved. Bernard Foley was in Nice. Was he? He was. Oh, excellent. Um, Did he bring his boots? <laughs> I'm, trying, <laughs> I'm now trying to think of who's injured in the Wallaby squad for him to come in. Um, yeah, Australia just didn't get going until the replacements came on and the replacements scrum half brought a lot of energy. Their, their try in the first half through Marky Mark, our favourite winger, was was jammy, to say the least, although it did come from quite a good Nick White, 50-22, even though they shouldn't have had the turnover. They just lacked... They, they seemed a bit surprised by Fiji's physicality, which you shouldn't be surprised by Fiji's physicality, but it, it threw them off their game completely. Mm. The one collision in particular on... I think it was a tackle from Aroni Maui, the Saracens prop on, oh, yeah. Carter, on poor Carter Gordon, where he basically, the ball then travelled about 10 metres forward because it popped out in the tackle. Big hits like that just threw Australia off. They couldn't get a grip on the game until Fiji's line-out disintegrated and, and until Botti had had to go off and, and Kuruvoli had had to go off with cramp. A, sh- a, shout-out, for, a shout-out for Aroni Maui, I think, at, at Saracens, yeah. who, you know, the front row um, has always been traditionally a sort of area of weakness for for Fiji and arguably across the Pacific Islanders across the board and and, and he's been excellent like absolutely awesome the past couple of weeks he was against Wales 
and he carried that on against Australia and really gave he gave James Slipper a right duffing up in, in, at scrum time obviously with the with the huge losses of Daniel Latipa and Will Skelton which I'm sure we're about to start chatting about and they're, yeah because they're both out against Wales and yeah. they were such a core part of their impressive scrum performance against Georgia that, and, but, it, but it's not just that it's their physicality and ability to get over the gain line as well that's a huge asset for Australia mm. that's now been stripped away Charlie how are they how do you see them sort of shaping up for for the game against Wales with Carter Gordon the 22 year old with the fantastic mullet is he he got hooked on 50 minutes Ben Donaldson went to 10 from fullback and actually they looked they looked a bit better could could that maybe a way to go against Wales it's going to have to be because of the because of the kind of the scarcity of options there and as you, and, and as you say Eddie Jones has got nobody to nobody to blame but himself because there are other ways that he could have gone and could have had that bit of experience just to underpin a quite a quite green back division but he hasn't got that I was watching and, and looking at Angus Bell 22 22 year old loose head and thinking for all his promise there seems to be so much riding on him not just as a carrier as as you say without Skelton and, and Tupu, Tupu they they were lacking there but also at scrum he went I think he went 75 minutes or, or, or even yeah, seven, 78 then, actually 78, because I was right. waiting I was trying to do the subs on my, sure. on my little sheet and I was like why isn't the replacement loose head <laughs> and I yet mean, after, after, also, yeah, even more with Angus Bell because Rob Valentini had a sort of bright-ish opening 10, 15 minutes, then looked completely anonymous, and and you you needed him to stand up and ball carry. Um, McWright isn't the the sort of biggest ball carrier, although he has improved that in his game, as Eddie's been talking about. So too Hooper. Their 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 strengths are in different areas of the game. Richie Arnold, not the biggest ball carrier in the world. Nick Frost as well in the tight. So yeah, it was there was a lot on Bell's shoulders. Uh, Karevi did look good, is what we should say. I thought I thought for, yeah. certainly in the first half, Karevi did look really good. But again, it's, it's as we're saying, and that's, as we've said with England, really another team that um, who's Eddie Jones has got his fingerprints all over, that, that, just lacking in ball carriers. Really, we lied by the way. There was an Aussie jackal um, turnover because it was by the bloke who replaced Karevi for Ketty, and it set up the the try that Australia got to make it fifteen twenty two because they yes they had a, they had a line so the one corner, so there was one. There was one. But versus Bottier and, and Tuasova and everybody else. Well, um, Bottier and Tuasova had six between them. Yeah, just just getting over the ball and showing. Um, I've never heard the phrase clear lift so much as Andrew Brace sort of muttering <laughs> it into my ruffling. If you if you show separation, he's going to he's gonna go for it. Um, just wanted to sort of give you a flavour of the reaction back in Australia to, to the defeat, which, as you can imagine, has been... Fairly spicy. Jamie Panderham, who's, who's an excellent journalist for the Australian Daily Telegraph, said that Australia look as ill-prepared as any team playing in France, which I think is probably the most damning statement you can give, especially given some of these teams have worked with very sort of ropey build-ups to the tournament with, li- with limited sort of preparation mm. and, and bad matches. And barely so, professional. Yeah. Them, them in England are sort of the flagship change of coach in, the, in just on the on the turn of the World Cup year, so that nobody's there isn't a template for success with that. And it, what's been interesting is, is that Jones and, and Borthwick have gone about it totally different ways. Borthwick with experience, Jones with these guys are totally new. Let's pick let's pick total inexperience, and then I'll govern the game plan, and we'll see how it goes. And it's fallen apart at the first sort of meaningful test of it. it- it- on, it, is, it is slightly strange that he's done that. In, it, there, there's a part of me, maybe a, a cynical part of me, that thinks he's done that just so that he has a sort of get out and a, and a get out clause and an excuse. Because even after that, even after that loss against Fiji, he was claiming in the, in the post post match sort of um, quotes bit that um, that he's building for a building Australia team for 2027. Well, and it's, it's going sort of like, to be interesting to see how that's tested, isn't it? Because I don't oh, think yeah. they're anyone's favourites against Wales. Yeah, they're going to be no. desperate, and and who knows? Maybe there's a trick up his sleeve. But if they lose that, they're the first Australia side to never make the knockout stages at a World Cup. Yeah, wow. I, I wonder if the shame of that and the embarrassment back home, and this rumours of an option in in the deal, I, I, I you just don't know. Do you? I, you have to say, I, th- I think with I think with Tupo and Skelton starting, I think Australia get by Wales. Not with ease, but sort of semi comfortably. I think. I, I think without them, it's properly game on, and it's it's almost a coin toss. I thought what they were doing in the rugby championship was actually quite interesting, as far as sort of that narrow phase play, trying to find that flow like France. But you take out two huge ball carriers, and you take out the fluency that they were getting in patches, 
and it all looks a bit different. It really does. It really does. Let's move on to the rest of the weekend's games with a quick roundup. Wales kind of cagey win over, over Portugal in Nice. Portugal were great fun, weren't they, Charlie? I loved it. I felt a bit muggy afterwards because sort of all the uh, I was just enchanted by how good Portugal had been, how much they'd moved the ball, both in the tight through their back row, especially were, were really good, and then when they went a bit wider, um, thought they defended defended pretty well as well. But afterwards, Patrice Legasque, their coach, was saying it was gutted. He kept saying how frustrated he was, and he said too shy was the word he used in the first half. Um, which suggests that they've got more to give and they can give it more air, which is a lot of fun. But no, I thought they 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 just look well coached, and it's just fun to watch the good coach teams who've got a plan and, and go about trying to kind of implement that. Um, Wales had made a lot of changes. looked like they looked like a side that had made a lot of changes. Um, they lost Tommy Rafael in the warm up, and Jack Morgan had to come in. Jack Morgan was brilliant. He was involved in the, um, setting up Louis Re Summit, whose whose try came after sort of this mad harem scareum. Um, Passage where the up the other end of the pitch, the Port- Portugal tight head had found himself in the in the thirteen channel and tried to put a grubber through, which was just it was, oh, it was just joy this whole this whole <laughs> game. Um, and then the other big positive for Wales was Talupe Falatao coming through with some sort of those effortlessly brilliant moments, like a, a try saving tackle. And then he was Wales scrum was kind of the big the big kind of um, the pivotal strength that they could they could lean on time and again and, and kind of. Poignantly enough, it was from a dominant scrum that Falatao got over for the bonus point on the final play, which gave it a sort of a very, very like England actually. Sort of Warren Gatland actually said, "Yeah, pretty, pretty ugly, but job done on Australia." Sort of vibe. That's fine, kind of verdict. That, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Can you just um, you had a chat with somebody post match? Can you just tell us about that? Yeah. So, so uh, Portugal scored a gorgeous line out move with a no look, no look transfer off the top to Nicholas Mart. Martins, I don't know, Martins, who who be, who scored yeah. having having with the, with there having been a dummy lift and him dummy lift coming out and sort of staying on the front and he said afterwards he thought he was I asked him to sort of talk it talk me through it and he said it had been their forwards coach David Gerrard who'd said look uh, Wales pile into that mall at the front and it leaves leaves a little bit of space and it was just a no look how he's the 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 player that they their number eight who they lifted swiveled away to sell them all even a bit more so just those little details I just really liked and actually Martins was superb in loads of areas he was he was really good in the defensive line out I think um, Wales lost three in a row at one point um, I think he topped the tackle count and he was just a lovely player really nice handler okay moving on and uh, we've got Ireland against Tonga which is on Saturday night in Nantes uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the 20 minute passage that Ireland had kind of in the second quarter, basically after they sort of, after Tonga had been quite aggressive at the breakdown and looked impressive and the, and the game was, was sort of tight. Ireland started heating up and had a lovely inside ball from to Kellen Doris to set up the tie burn try. And, and the, and the passage of play that followed that, that sort of 15, 20 minutes, they were, they were quite exceptional. Ireland, mm. truly best team in the world, quality, passes sticking which just shouldn't <laughs> which most teams would struggle to make stick the way they were sort of cutting through for the tries Sexton had had that lovely big moment where he got to celebrate in front of the fans and um, that's actually three three tries now in two games we say afterwards he doesn't score many tries well that's just a lie at the age of 38 he's he's honed these support lines like a a cultured striker just waiting for the right moment to strike he's uh, he's done very well um so yeah, I thought Ireland during during those twenty minutes they were just irresistible, playing fantastic rugby. Felt for Tonga because first game of the tournament and you have to face Ireland who've already been able to get, you know, get warmed up against Romania the week before. So you're coming in cold against the world's number one side. I got to have a chat afterwards with Charles Pietau, just about what it's been like for him. He's one of the the five or the many former All Blacks who've who've come into this Tonga team over the last few months or so, following the, following the change regarding eligibility. And he sort of laid out to me the differences between being a, a tier one player with the All Blacks and what you get, and then trying to do it with a tier two team and, and just how vast the differences are. So here's a, here's a bit of audio from him. For me, it's definitely been just a, a lack of resources. Like we come into the Tonga team, we hardly have any um, kit or one pair of shorts to train for the week. We always got to wash every day. We've got one, we might not have snacks and, um, to replenish ourselves after a gym session. I would, um, you know, uh, since I was in my to cover our own flights to get to camp. So, uh, you know, this, I think sometimes all that 
off-field things can add up in what I've been a part of with the All Black setup is that all you need to worry about is playing that game and doing your, doing your role on that jersey, get clothes from it. Uh, come naked, mate, walk away with enough clothes, you don't need anything, you get a watch and whatnot, but I think that's just part of the two and two, and two nations, and the one thing I've been um, pretty proud of is just seeing how resilient these guys are, that's been the Tonga team, guys that's played a lot of tests, and their haters just carry on, at the end of the day, try and still give your best for Tonga. Ireland in the end, running loads of tries, I think that's 20 now over the first two games, scored about 140 points and conceded 24 or 25, That's that's a nice start the schedule does just favor them in a way doesn't it because they they get to play out these games and then it's all into south africa this week charlie what a mouth-watering game it's going to be the sort of physical physicality up front alone is fascinating what do you make of it i can't wait i can't wait to see how ireland go about breaking down a south africa defense that is really intense and really intelligent in itself um i keep thinking about what Andy Farrell says he wants his attack to be, which is, he always talks about it being messy, and it's quite an interesting word, but I think what he's kind of getting at is how players like Matt Hansen, um just enhance it by their own intuition. And there is there is this sort of, obviously, base of the structure and the shape that they've got and those little tip-ons that their forwards can play, but out the back of that is sort of where the magic happens, isn't it? And it's how those players pick up touches, where they pick up touches, how often they pick up touches. And it's so going to be so interesting because, you know, these are two te- these are two teams that are going to want to go really deep into the tournament. It's how much they want that top top spot really with Ireland still to play, still to play Scotland. And you wonder whether when it gets if it gets really tight, South Africa, knowing that they've already got that win in the bag over Scotland, how much that comes into it. Even um, obviously South Africa messing around playing playing Romania using three different hookers, two of which are actually back rowers um they've just had a just had a really interesting tournament already if you think about the traffic lights and the willy won'tly about andre pollard um a lot of fun they want that top spot now won't they after after what france did to new zealand i know that it was always billed as very tight between france and new zealand in that pool but i think i don't think you want france you don't want france in a quarter final in in paris at home i don't think i think you'd rather have new zealand wouldn't you and i I think to start off with we were saying uh, it doesn't really matter in that side of the draw but i think now i know new zealand did look very good in that win against namibia but it was namibia and um i think now i think ireland will want new zealand in a quarter despite what happened in 2019 i think they'll want that the key to everything i think on saturday is is ireland's lineup because when the lineup doesn't run perfectly and, and there were a few times in the warm-ups where they struggled to quite get a connection mm. on Saturday it produced I think six out of their eight tries kind of started from the uh, and and Tonga's defense admittedly sort of struggled as the game went on but the lineup was everything for Ireland in terms of setting the platform and then attacking off it so Africa as we know I think Paul O'Connell said this afterwards in the mix zone best defensive lineup in the world so good at disrupting a ball so good at if even if you get get it and get down and set and then let to play. It's so good at getting arms over and disrupting. Everything feels like it just hinges off that area. Is line is Ireland's lineup going to be strong enough to basically launch those strike moves? Etzebeth back as well. So yeah. they'll have Etzebeth, Moster and Detoy probably yeah, that's that'll do it. That'll do it. And, and just very finally a word on, on Bundyaki who's who's playing playing lovely stuff. He he basically Spent the first 50 minutes against Tonga just running into brick walls constantly, just soaking up big carries. And then by the end, he was just cutting through and showing a bit of pace, Charles, yeah. to round the last man for his he first look, try. He looks incredibly sharp. I mean, we had this brief chat last week, didn't we, about sort of how Ireland are going to sort of select their midfield for, for South Africa and maybe for Scotland and beyond. Um, and we weren't, we didn't quite come to a, a firm conclusion, but I think we'd have to say now that Aki's the banker there. Mm. You know, he looks, mm. he looks in in as good a form as we've seen him. It's just a question now as presumably they will play ring rows outside him and it's just a question of whether they go for slightly punchier Henshaw against South Africa, but I don't think they will. I think it will be Aki and ring rows again. It's kind of telling who they brought off early, wasn't it? Um, mm. And I think it was a bit of a surprise actually that, that Aki stayed on and, and towards the end when he was sort of hobbling around, saw a lot of calls for him to just get him off or play with 14. He's, he's that important. <laughs> and I think, it, yeah, I think, I, I think you're right, Charles, it's almost an Aki plus one, but almost certainly Aki and Ringrose I'd said to Andy Farrell that Aki was in my fancy team and that he hadn't done much in the first half so could he stay on for the second and he was like yeah sure Thumb, yeah, thumbs let's up. not talk about fancy rugby. thumbs up from the uh, from the coaching box at my request um, just finally in this in this section France against Uruguay feels like an age ago on um, 
last Thursday. Last uh, Thursday, yeah. Charles, can you sort of break down? Charlie's talked about the uh, the tension in the in the uh, restaurants and bars of Nice is. Uh, as Uruguay made life difficult, but that's great, isn't it? We we want that in a way. We want the the teams that you know we might not know as much about to you know cause chaos. Yeah, we absolutely do want it, but can it just not be against teams that I've back, backed and picked as, <laughs> as, as winners, please? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of tension in my front room as well. Um, yeah, France obviously they did make twelve changes. Um, I'm not convinced that's a good enough excuse um, for that performance. Um, as as um, sharp as Uruguay looked. That French team, on paper, was is a, is a class above quite a lot of other starting teams. Certainly, that that French team shouldn't be losing to to Italy. Really, I, I don't think an Italy first team um, with the class and the depth that France have. So, um, yeah, that's a bit of a kick up the backside for France, I think, and maybe a bit of a wake up call. And um, I think Galtier knows it actually, and I think they got away with one there a little bit. That could have been. After the after the high of New Zealand the Friday before, that could have been a real, real low and a bit of a derailment of the entire thing. So I, I think to get past that and to have that wake-up call, to have a bit of a reset, apparently all the big guns are coming back for Namibia, poor old Namibia. Um, and, and I think then we will see um, more momentum on the French side, certainly. Was, was there anyone out of that game who potentially did enough to force their way into like the, the gun team, the best team, do you think? Um, not the starting team, but obviously uh, Sekou Makalu, the, 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 the flanker who can also play wing, who is, who is an, an outstanding talent, um, was left off the bench. He's usually historically been a bench man for Galtier due to his versatility and his dynamism off the bench. He was um, left out of the 23 against New Zealand as, as Galtier went 5-3 split. Um, I think... He, he was good enough and he put his hand up and, and, and showed enough spark in that quite dreary French effort that he will be back on the bench, I think. Maybe not against Namibia, but certainly in the bigger games um, against Italy and in a quarterfinal, I think he'll be back. It was sort of a tiny subplot and, and don't apply this to South Africa, Romania because it doesn't work. But, but France made loads of changes, struggled. Wales made loads of changes, struggled. Ireland basically stuck with the, the gun team for the second week in a row against against Tonga and, and actually won one at a canter. It was just interesting how our teams are sort of managing how do you rest players and make changes and give everybody a go? How do you keep momentum going with your strongest side? Well with that the rest week that we were talking about last week that kind of makes it easier to do that doesn't it? Mm. And that's and that's kind of a big I, th- I imagine that was a big part of Ireland's thinking if we stay strong we've got that rest week and we can manage that. You manage players workloads Fairly easy. I think that could be a bit of a bit of a lesson to England actually, because you don't want to make a load of changes, look really bitty and clunky, and then sort of lose lose a bit of momentum. You know, that's our roundup. Let's get into some of your questions. Very very large thank you to all of you for sending them in. Right, let's get into some of your readers' questions. Um, just want to start with a story uh, written by Gavin Mayers, an exclusive about sort of the ongoing in the background tensions within the RFU Council where. 30 members of the 65 member panel of the council have signed a letter outlining a series of fears and claiming that the board um, are providing insufficient leadership controls and scrutiny over the performance of the RFU executive. So it's sort of an attack on the leadership of Bill Sweeney, the chief executive and the chair, Tom Alube. It's also a forecast that the RFU is set to lose 161 million over the next nine years. Charles, this this is the kind of story that we'd maybe expect when mm. uh, England went out of the World Cup or <laughs> or sort of the week after the, f- the final, but it just sort of shows how bad things are in the background, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's telling that, that in, in their statements, the RFU and Tom Alube have said that they're disappointed with the timing of the uh, of the letter rather than the contents of it. Um, you know, it, I mean, and, and I do agree with that in, in a sense, i.e., the timing isn't isn't outstanding in the middle of a World Cup where England are nine points out of a possible ten from two games, um, including a, a really good win over the the team that they were sort of most had backed them to lose against. Uh, however, you can't deny that it's been um, a really rough uh, 12, 13 months now for English Rugby Union and Bill Sweeney and Tom Alube are at the top of that. They're paid a substantial amount of money to run the Rugby Football Union. Um Three premiership clubs going to the wall, tackle height fiasco. Um, I can understand greatly the uh, the concerns and the um, uh, the worries of the of the RFU council. The financial aspect is is really interesting and something we've sort of spoken about, I think, before regarding Steve Balfour because he's almost 
untouchable in his role, whatever happens, because the cost of, of removing him is something that the RFU simply cannot afford to, to pay. And luckily, it, it seems as though it's not going to. We're not going to end up in that situation where we're talking about it in a couple of weeks. But but that there is a, a real financial pressure there, which I think people don't quite appreciate. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, I mean, I need to sort of dig deeper into it. I, you do wonder why why there is such a black hole. Is it still a a COVID black hole backlog thing? Because obviously, the the tests that they've had at Twickenham, Fiji uh, warm up aside, have all been sold out. Those tickets go for astronomical amounts of money. We have stories all the time about how people are being priced out of Twickenham. They have a they have really good corporate deals, um, so they make a lot of money on match day. Um, so. And obviously, they made a lot of staff redundant just before COVID or during COVID the community, in the community game. So clearly, there has been a bit of balancing of books. So I'd, I'd like to see more about the forecasts and where the council... I mean, I'm sure they're correct, but I just haven't seen the, the sort of numbers and the figures as to where why council believe that, uh, you say, 190 million lost over... 161, 161 projected over the next nine years. million over the next nine years. I mean, that is a, that is a lot of money. Um so yeah, I'm I'm guessing this is going to run on, and and we're not get, you're not going to be hearing the last of this on today's podcast. It's a lot of reusable um, Guinness cups at Twickenham Stadium. That isn't it. Was that my, is was my I first. Think you're limited to twenty quid a person now. Um, <laughs> not you? that I'd know that. Not that you'd know that. Um, yeah, more on that story is the work at Panzac. Because I think that what's going to happen with with Bill Sweeney in particular is is really interesting. Um, some more questions about the tournament. One from Rachel, just asking. How do you see Pool C panning out now after Fiji's win over Australia? And would England prefer to play Wales, Fiji or Australia in the quarterfinals? Which actually I think is it's quite an interesting question because we didn't talk about it earlier, but England, Fiji, part two in the quarters. Charlie, that would be that'd be quite fun, wouldn't it? Fiji with Bottier and two is over. They didn't have it Twickenham. Mm. I don't think Fiji's performance will have made England want to kick it less. <laughs> for sure, because they will not want to. We want. They will not want to be tackled anywhere near Bottier or Tuis over. Um, it, well, it all obviously hinges on Gatlin versus Jones, doesn't it? And, and I think, as Charles made the point earlier, Tupu and Skelton is just such a big loss. And I think it will take a lot for for Jones to sort of ra- ra- rouse that Wallaby side after what will be what will have been seriously disheartening. Um, and on that basis, you go Wales Fiji, don't you? Going three? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, England would prefer to face Wales in a quarterfinal, I think, of that three, because Fiji are scary. Um, Australia have world-class players, and Tupo and Skelton are supposed to be back fit for a potential quarterfinal if they get there. And I think with Australia at full strength, they could trouble anybody on their day with Tupo and Skelton and fully firing. So I think England would prefer to face Wales. But yeah, I mean, at the minute, if you're a betting man, it's going to be an England-Fiji rematch in the quarterfinal, isn't it? I actually I actually think, in this disagree I think I think they wouldn't mind having Fiji again. Just because of that line out, I think that's a really big area they get into the game. Um, having said that, it would be a better better Fiji side than the one that won at Twickenham, wouldn't it? You, so you think, you, you, do you think that they'd prefer Fiji over Wales in the quarters? Yes, I do. I, I just, I just think Wales could take them really, really deep. They won't get bored with the kicking exchanges at all. Either way, either way, it's good. I mean, England Wales quarterfinal would be really ugly. I, I think, <laughs> way, I think Wales are actually maybe a bit better than we just watching them in Bordeaux the first sixty minutes. If they could stop doing this thing where they switch off in the final fifteen, that seems to make Warren Gatlin want to explode. That would be really good. Because they did that at Twickenham, didn't they, in the warm-up? Mm. And then they did it against Fiji as well. And they threatened to do it against Portugal yeah. Yeah, for a moment. So if, if they can just park whatever that is, because that seems to be holding them back, I actually think there's quite a good side there. With, with Fiji, if it was England-Fiji again, if Fiji do what they did against Australia, where they're bossing the breakdown and they get a bit of a lead, I don't think I'd trust England to come from behind. At no, that's a great point. If they're, let's say, 10, 12 points down, down. I don't know if I. I don't know if I was watching it. If I'd feel confident in them being able to do that. It's a lot of drop goals. It's a lot of drop. It's a lot of drop goals. So I. So I think for that reason, and the way Fiji can explode into games, I think Fiji would be quite a scary proposition. The avenue of the England Australia quarter final potential quarter final that I haven't discussed is how England play play press that week, because you know how Eddie Jones is going to play press that week. He will put himself up absolutely every single day mm. for 
player slots, management slots to just get as many quotes as you can from me in in the paper. I imagine asking where I am. <laughs> oh yeah, I, we nearly got through the whole podcast without without doing that. He um he didn't ask after you. Oh, in, well. Uh, oh well, I'm still here, Eddie. Eddie. And I'm sorry to charity boxing match to next say year. He was <laughs> yeah. Yeah, is that, is that an official it. an official announcement? Let's do it. Catch weight. <laughs> yeah. um, w- wanted to finish up just with a question from uh, Will about greasy balls and and how and sort of we we touched on it earlier, but whether we're going to see teams sort of improving as the heat lessens in the tournament, and also there was someone else raised a good point that temperatures are expected to come down. I think in France next weekend. So Charles is our is our local French weather expert. That should mean less heat. Less humidity, more more jouet. Well, temperatures coming down will definitely mean less heat. Yes, I mean huge <laughs> news actually here. Meteor- meteorologists at the table. Um, yeah, I mean it, it should. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's a tricky one really because I know England have played in the south a lot where it's been very hot, but it was also incredibly hot in Paris and incredibly humid. And did, haven't quite seen as many drop balls in the French capital and in other venues as down south. So that's what I'm saying. I don't know. I, I'm going to reserve judgment until England have played. If England are going to go and play in a sort of cooler climb and and they don't drop anything, then okay, I'll believe this. But then if they're still dropping lots of balls, then I don't know. I don't know. We'll have we'll have to revisit that next week. It doesn't seem to actually be the ball, the actual ball itself. It just seems no. to be the conditions that are causing havoc. I can yeah. actually tell you where the most handling errors have been by stadium right now because it's in front of me. Oh, that's great. Ne- nice is top, really, with forty five, and then it's Sanetien with forty three. Okay. Which would you say is south, Charles, in France? Just, just sort of central just. south. And then it's Marseille. So, so Marseille and Nice in the top three for handling errors. I mean, so there, there, there is a, you know, it's not an excuse. There is a slight connection there. But how hot was Bordeaux, Cosy, for, for Wales? Fiji? Oh, unbearable. <laughs> it was. It was I, think, that's what I think you're sort of clutching it, at straws a little bit yeah. by, with, with temperatures. If it's 35 or 34, I don't think that's making any difference to, to handling errors. I guess what I'm saying is, is this going to be something we're still talking about when we get to the semifinals? I hope not. Prob- <laughs> probably <laughs> probably not. So, but, but we'll see. We'll all find out. Right, that's it for today. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charles. Um, wh- what's your schedules for the week? Where are you? What are you doing? I'm back here in London. Back here in London to Lille, back end of the week. Lille, which games? Just England, just England, Chile. Just England, Chile. Oh, I, I, I want Chile to, to, you know, have a moment or two. I, I think they will do. Let's see them get a try. I, I wouldn't actually mind a France Uruguay repeat, but England, Chile. That'd be quite fun. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Can't see it, but yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> shot me down um, very good I'm going to be in Leon for Wales against Australia on Sunday and all the uh, grenades in the build up as well between Eddie Jones and Warren Gatlin look out for those on the Telegraph Sport website another huge weekend coming up Ireland South Africa Wales Australia Argentina Samoa don't sleep on it could be could be really spicy so it's my prediction <laughs> it's D-Day <laughs> it is D-Day for my prediction we will be across all of those games and everything else going on with lots of great analysis on the website from our columnists Brian Moore Will Greenwood Gavin Mayers and, and all the rest of us as well enjoy the action we'll catch you next week but until then from all three of us thank you and goodbye Hello Telegraph Rugby Podcast listeners. I'm Danny Kerr and I've teamed up with Erwin Mitchell, the official legal partner of England Rugby, to share some special moments that matter from the game we care so much about. Search for Moments That Matter with Erwin Mitchell and The Telegraph.